Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I am Dan Dalton. I'm with PASA. Um, for those of you who are joining us for a second or a third uh, uh, session in this uh, series, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, this Fundamentals of IPM series um, is a, a series of workshops and webinars that we're running throughout the summer. Um, we originally had planned to have an in-person version of this, but because of the, the COVID-19 uh, quarantine uh, issues, we weren't able to do that. But we decided to translate it into a, a virtual program and we've been having a really great response. Um, IPM uh, is something that we think uh, for the purposes of, of, of our work is really fundamental to developing you know, a strong, resilient farming system. So we covered uh, a greenhouse and hoop house uh, fundamentals the first week. Uh, we did an open forum Q&A uh, two weeks ago. Tonight we'll be talking about disease uh, recognition and management uh, in vegetable crops in just a minute. Uh, two weeks from now we're going to be having a, a weed management forum, uh, a series of presentations, a couple of farmers, a couple of experts. Um, our uh, key speakers uh, in two weeks will be uh, uh, Eric Nordell, uh, from Beach Grove Farm. If you don't know Eric, he is one of the uh, absolute gurus of weed control through the last 20 or 30 years. So we're really excited to have him and hear from him about his approach to weed management. Uh, Sam Hitchcock Tilton will also be speaking. Uh, he is an expert on uh, mechanical weed control from uh, Wisconsin uh, in the Midwest. Uh, he was a speaker at the conference uh, this last year in February and was one of our highest rated speakers. So we're really excited to have him come back and speak in a, in a focused way uh, it's for, to everyone in season, you know, in the midst of, of whatever weed issues you might be having. So uh, we hope you can join us for those. Uh, we will be offering uh, two more sessions after that. Uh, July 14th, uh, we're going to be talking about perspectives on IPM from an orchard. Uh, orchard perspective with uh, Ike Kirshner from North Star Orchard. Um, they have both vegetable and fruit production at their farm and uh, you know fruit if you know anything is, is really needs a lot of pest management so we're excited to hear from Ike about perspectives sort of straddling the world of fruit and veggies. And then finally uh, in mid-August we're going to be working with Abby Seaman from Cornell to hear about taking uh, IPM out into the field so pest management uh, out in the field as a, as a grower. So really, really excited. Feel like this is a nice suite that's going to cover a lot of our bases as far as uh, pest management goes for all of you. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Steve, tonight's expert, Steve Bogash. Uh, Steve works with Marone Bioinnovations uh, and is, is one of our most popular speakers year in and year out on, on all things uh, disease and pest management. So Steve, take it away. Thank you, Dan, and good evening and welcome, everyone. I see the audience is still piling in, so um, let's get this kicked off. Um, so bring up that. There we go. And you should all be looking at my primary screen right now. So That's good. Uh, good. So um, the, we're going to be talking about fundamentals of IPM, recognizing and managing diseases in vegetable crops. Um, I am the uh, territory business manager for Marone Bio after retiring from Extension. I did a short stint with a fertilizer company. And then since that time have moved on and now have been, I'm gonna two and a half years with Marone Bio. I started using Regalia back oh, it's 15 years ago, maybe 14 years ago. And it allowed me to start using a lot less, less synthetic materials and solve a lot of problems that um, the synthetics simply weren't weren't solving. And so that's been really interesting to me as I've moved into biologicals and organic. Because of the audience this evening, um, I've done a lot of seminars for PASA over the years. Um, we're going to keep really tightly to organic control, whether they are biological or mineral like copper and sulfur, but we're going to be hearing really closely. But I am going to make a few synthetic chemical com um, comments. I believe that they fit into the world of sustainability, if not for certified organic. Um, you're just going to have to filter those, but I will make it really clear when I'm doing that when we get into those. But we have a lot of material to cover, and so let's try to move forward. There we go. So first off, um, Marone Bio Innovations. We are a public. Heard somebody. Um, we are a publicly traded company. 
Um, this long statement that is our safe harbor statement. Um, this basically says that um, I'm going to be saying some wonderful hey, things. Hey, you want to be over there? Somebody, please turn off that microphone. Um, I'm going to be saying some wonderful things about bio products and Marone products in general, and they may motivate you to want to run ahead and buy stock. What this statement says with a whole lot of words is do your research first. Don't just run out and buy stock willy nilly. Um, I am a stockholder for full transparency. And so you should do your research before you do that. Um, so um, an announcement. So I do a weekly pest management teleconference every Wednesday at 1230 in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. Um, I host a pest management teleconference. This is 100% audio. We're just doing this by phone because I want to be able to pull off the side of the road if I need to and do this. I have a guest expert every week. Um, tomorrow is Meg McGrath, Dr. McGrath. She's a, a pathologist from Cornell. She's based out at the Long Island Research Station. And I have a published list of everybody who's going to be on for the next couple of weeks. Plus, we record these. Um, so the eight of them that are recorded, you can get access to. Um, the information is right there. And um, there's reference numbers one through eight, first one being number one, and last week's was number eight. So you can, ca you can catch these 30-minute recordings. Um, my email will be on at the very end of this. You are welcome to contact me and I will send you the most current press release that's got who's been on and who will be coming on shortly. Um, oh, and in two weeks, so, well, not two weeks, but so this tomorrow is Meg McGrath from Cornell Pathologist. The following week is Brian Nott, um, and Brian is an entomologist from Cornell. He's out of the Geneva Research Station, and I continue to have different experts on every week. These are former colleagues of mine, play people that I know, folks who do research. The half an hour goes really quickly, but if you can't participate live, please uh, call in and catch the recordings. So first we got to classify the diseases. Um, it's the very beginning of where we go with all this. And so um, there, are fun there are both biotic and abiotic disorders. Um, biotic, that's fungal, bacterial, viral, and nematodes. Um, oh, and I'm fairly sure this is recorded so you can access this. So I see, I see the occasional people taking pictures of the screens. You can access all this. And again, my email will be at the very end. Um, then you've got nutritional disorders and we'll be going through some pictures of some of these. Um, and you need to be able to recognize them because some of them look very um, biotic-ish. Um, and so you need to be able to tell the difference. Even though most of you who are on this are probably organic growers, that does not mean that uh, herbicide damage is something you won't experience because you probably live in a world where there are conventional farmers very near you. And we're gonna take a look at some of those kind of symptoms. Um, there are phytotoxicities, what you spray on matters. And even water, um, if the temperature is 95 degrees and really over 85 in a really hot day, and you go out and spray just water on your plants, um, you can burn them that way. And so we'll be looking at some phytotoxic problems um, over and under watering. Um, being able to water vegetables, being able to water plants, period, is a skill set. And I find that most folks try and dump this on the lowest person on their totem pole. Um, watering vegetables, since we're going to talk vegetables today, that is a job for the genius in your household. It is one of the hardest things to do well, and yet it's one of those places that pays you back the most. Um, we'll look at some overwatering, edemas, which are always interesting. And then my favorite, some weather incident related. So the transplant that you see on the screen here, that is a very high EC tomato transplant. You can see the burning, you can see how chlorotic it is. And that is a, it's a relatively young plant. And um, the EC, that's the electrical conductivity, which is an indic indicator of how much uh, nutrients are available in the root zone. A lot of organic potting medias use a dairy-based compost for their nutrient charge, for their fertilizer source, and often they put too much in. Um, and I understand why. It's, it's always hard balancing all that. Tomatoes are really, really sensitive, and you can see how it set that particular transplant back. So that's a real concern. Um, and we'll be talking about some other, this is not a disease, it's, a biotic, it's an abiotic disorder, um, and so we're going to be talking about how to recognize those. So this is herbicide injury. This is classic broadleaf weed killer um, herbicide injury. You can see that curled tomato leaf in the middle of the other leaves there. Um, and so there's an awful lot of herbicide weed killers that are in that class. 
it takes so little to damage tomatoes. Um, and sometimes it can be from the mulch hay that you got. Um, there are herbicides that get sprayed on hay, um, and some of them will last for a very long time. Tomatoes can be damaged at parts per billion, and I'm talking single digit parts per billion. So sometimes diagnosing this is really easy. We're packing a lot into an hour and a half this evening. And what I'm really hoping to give you is some idea of what you're up against and so open up your eyes so that you're looking. I always like to work with farmers who are three dimensional thinkers. You're, you're not just looking at the plants, but you're thinking about what happened a week ago and two weeks ago, what you've been applying, who's been in the field, all of these things are part of IPM. It's a very, very big picture. Um, the photo on the right, that's a pumpkin flower. It's not supposed to look like that. That is, that is again, that is herbicide injury. So when you see crinkling, twisting, uh, when you feel that tomato leaf, it actually feels kind of leathery, you probably ought to start thinking that maybe I'm looking at some kind of an herbicide or at least something that's hormonally affecting the plants. We'll talk about all this a little bit more. Um, so this is blossom end rot. Um, into this, I'm showing tomatoes and peppers here. So first off, blossom end rot certainly looks like a disease. All this means is that your calcium level at the time that that fruit was set was too low. And so you can't fix it. So once a fruit is hanging, it's already too late. Um, you've actually, uh, you've changed the cells they call it blossom end rot <clears throat> because it generally occurs mostly on the blossom end, and you see that in these peppers. But I put this particular tomato picture in there because um, that's on the sidewall. It, uh, just because it's called blossom end rot does not mean it has to happen on the blossom end. I am a strong proponent of uh, tissue testing. I like to tissue my, test my tomatoes. Um, the first one happens after four weeks and then every two weeks for the rest of the season. This is obviously for commercial growers. Uh, that way you know what's going on. Soil testing and tissue testing are completely different. It's, tissue testing tells you what the plant is taking up. Your soil test tells you what you're starting at. During the season, I tissue test. I don't care as much what's in the soil as I do what my plants are taking up. Broad mites, and so we still haven't gotten into a real disease yet. We haven't gotten into a fungal, bacterial, or viral problem. So this, this, is, uh, this is a problem caused by broad mites. Um, didn't hardly see this in uh, the Northeast Mid-Atlantic till about eight years ago, and then it came on really strong. So broad mites are very tiny mites. They are about a third to a quarter the size of a spider mite. So if you've ever seen a spider mite, you can see them on a leaf. I mean, they're tiny, but they're recognizable because broad mites are so tiny and they like to hide down deep in the bud scales. They're very, very hard to spot. Um, but what you get, peppers really show it badly. So what you see in that image is, we call it leathering or alligator skin on the peppers. Um, and so once you have them, it's very, very difficult to control them. You've got to be very, very proactive, but this is mite management to manage this particular problem. The image that you're looking at in the center, that is a transplant that had gotten um, broad mites really early. And the one on the right is the most extreme version I've ever seen. This image was actually sent to me. Believe it or not, that's a bell pepper plant that broad mites have gotten to. And the problem is the saliva that broad mites put out um, affects plants very much the way that broadleaf weed killers affect plants. And so you've got to manage for these. My experience tells me that if you had broad mites last year, um, you probably need to start managing them from the very beginning of the season this year, and you don't ever get to stop. They have a really bad habit um, that the when the male gets very close to maturity, he finds a juvenile female that's a day or two away. He glues her to him and then, then tags along on the first other insect that comes along and he has himself a new colony on the next plant. It's a really interesting way of spreading themselves around, but it makes them really effective at moving themselves around. You see them mostly in high tunnels or greenhouses, but it's not unusual to see some field damage as well. This next one, because I want to do a broad, broad range of vegetables, this is calcium deficiency on butter lettuce. It's not unusual to see calcium deficiencies in lettuces when grown indoors. And this is simply the plants aren't transpiring enough. So they're not moving enough moisture through their system to really carry enough calcium. 
And so the best way to fix this particular problem, this is still a nutrient problem, and you may have plenty of calcium going to your plants, uh, but you put a vertical fan in so that you're drawing air back across them and back up so that you increase transpiration. That will generally solve this problem. Uh, but this, that burning that is not, a, that is not caused by a, a fungal or bacterial organism, this is 100% calcium deficiency. So you can start getting the idea on how challenging some of this is. Uh, these are aphid vectored viruses. So now we're getting into biological organisms, um, but these are, these are vectored by aphids. We have about five primary viruses of vine crops here in the Northeast. Um, and so they all end up modeling or twisting the leaves. It's not hard to recognize that you have a virus. When, when the plants get older, it's not nearly as big a deal. So it's not unusual to go to a pumpkin field um, in the end of August and see quite a bit of the modeling like you see in the image on the right, that various colors. It's just not that unusual to see that. If it happens late enough, it may not matter to your crop. But if it gets in there in end of June or beginning of July and they get these viruses, you'll get pumpkins that have all kinds of blotchy colors to them. You may find a few customers that like how funky they look, uh, but generally when folks want to buy jack-o'-lanterns, they want nice pretty orange jack-o'-lanterns and this detracts. So what this means is that if you're growing vine crops, managing aphids is a really big deal. And um, aphid problems start at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So we are, we're already way into aphid season. And it was some of the first phone calls I was getting this year where I'm looking at aphid damage on my high tunnel tomatoes. Again, just simply not very unusual to see this. Um, there, you can match these, these up and identify which viruses there are, but it really doesn't matter. They're all aphid vectored. The only way to manage them is to manage the aphids. This is cost copper damaged muskmelons, what often are called cantaloupes in the area. And so copper is a really important fungicide. We'll be discussing this later on for, for organic growers. Um, we use an awful lot of it. Most organic growers are trying to limit the amount of copper. There is a wide degree of sensitivity in muskmelons as to how they tolerate copper. So when you're choosing your varieties, um, work with your seed company closely. Make sure, because copper is just so darn important in managing um, vegetable diseases in vine crops, make sure you're doing varieties that are at least tolerant of copper. And you can see in the two images, the image on the left, um, quite a bit of yellowing with some green centers, and the image on the right with, that, right with that yellow margin. So the kind of damage it can do can vary widely. Um, you should be getting an idea now on how challenging um, diagnosing some of these problems is. So um, we're looking at cucumbers on the left. That's cucumber beetle feeding. And so cucumber beetles bring two particular problems. Uh, one is on mature plants, they may not kill the plant outright, uh, but they'll feed on young fruit. They'll feed on the skin of young fruit. And as those fruit expand and they expand very quickly, uh, the damage becomes very visible. So your uh, crop of uh, number one cucumbers that had a decent value all of a sudden becomes a bunch of number twos or culls. Not exactly something you want to take to your farm market or farmer's market stand. Um, so that can be a really big problem. Managing cucumber beetles is one of the toughest challenges for organic growers. It's not easy for conventional um, synthetic chemistry growers, uh, but they have a wider bunch of materials. Uh, for organic growers, you're very limited. Um, you have some cultural things like grow covers, couple insecticides. So um, Marone, we manufacture two insecticide miticides, Grand Evo and Venerate. Neither of them really does a whole lot on cucumber beetles. They're a very tough pest. It's one of the holy grails for us is finding a material that will manage beetles without damaging bees. It's a really big challenge. So the one on the right is edema. And you can see how the skin looks on that particular piece of fruit. Um, that is 100% water relations inside the plant. So this has been a roller coaster of the springtime so far. We were extremely early at one point, and then springtime just stopped. It was like we froze in place for four weeks. It, it was relatively cool and just a little bit ago. That's the ideal time to start seeing these edemas. Plants will bank water, they will blister, um, and do lots of other odd things. But edemas typically mean that we are, you're having a problem with water relations inside the plant. And that goes back to 
the genius on your farm should be doing the watering. Watering is one of those things that it's worthwhile to get into, and I won't use the word argument, um, but it's worthwhile to get into a heated discussion um, about when you should water and how much to water. It's a really big deal. I am a huge proponent of tensiometers or earometers. Um, these are devices, and we don't have time to go into them, but these are devices that will help you determine how much water you have in your soil and how much is available to your plants. I prefer working with what I like to call dry growers over a wet grower. You are much better off to have a lighter hand. You can always add more. It's really difficult when you have three cool, cloudy, rainy days to take water out that you've already put in. So be very aware of the weather that's coming, water based on that, and you can always add more, or at least I hope you can always add more. Um, this was a visit I did, uh, I think this was last week, early last week, I did this to some high tunnels over in Lancaster. I'm in the Harrisburg, PA area, and you can see this is edema on tomato plants, and you can see how the cells, um, you can see one image through there what the top of the leaves look like, but the bottom of the leaves are kind of blown up with these um, light colored blisters. The fruit actually looked good. Um, this soil was very shaly. It had a perched water table. And so some plants looked great and other plants did not. It's, it, it makes um, navigating this um, ID of problems really challenging. It's not like you get to walk in and you match up a picture and you go, this is what's wrong and this is how I'm going to fix it. It takes a lot of experience doing that and you want to think about everything that's going on. So, so far this has been a largely indoor season, high tunnel and greenhouses. I'm, when I go in, I'm very cognizant. I want to know what the heat source is. I want to know how old the heater is. Heaters start leaking over time. Um, uh, do their heaters, does the, um, does the, the, the smokestack, does it leak? Does it look like it's in good condition? What kind of fuel are they using? I, the worst houses I ever go into burn coal. Um, coal can be a good source. Obviously, it's a strong pollutant, but for heat, it can be a good source. But I want that coal furnace to be in an adjacent building and they're just pumping hot air or hot water, preferably hot water into the house because coal fumes, and I'll show you pictures of those later on, coal fumes can be quite the problem. Uh, hail damage. I don't know if this gets more obvious than this, um, but after a hailstorm, um, one of the first things to do is get out there and assess what kind of hailstorm that you had. Some of them, um, if there's a lot of rain and the hail is small, you may not notice a whole lot of damage. Others, like you're looking at here, can just absolutely shred and destroy a crop to the point that you just, the only thing you can do is take it all out, um, or at least pick off all the damaged fruit and try and go on. If if you get in a situation where you get hail, you get hit by hail or strong wind damage, assess it, see whether you think there's anything worth saving. Um, I like to go in and spray with a peroxyacetic acid material. You'll often see these called PAAs. My company sells a JetAg 5. There are many other brands on the market. I like to go in immediately and apply that. Um, the nice thing about these strong oxidants is they do a really good job of killing all the spores that are out in the field. So um, the botrytis that probably is now getting in, the bacterial diseases, you get a moment to freeze everything in time while you collect your wits up. So these peroxyacetic acid materials are wonderful for that. You have to remember they have no residual whatsoever. So you apply them. They give you a chance to ponder your navel. What did I do wrong? What did I do right? What can I do at this point? And then make decisions based on that. Um, and so having that kind of material on hand, uh, remember with these peroxy materials, they are uh, very strong oxidants. Um, you get them on your skin, it can burn. Um, once it's mixed up into a solution, not nearly as dangerous, but they are very strong oxidants. Read the label on them, manage them correctly, wear proper PPE. And so for my company, I'm going to say that three times in a row. Read the label, um, wear proper PPE, and I'll make sure I say that one more time during that. Um, the labels really help, help out a lot when you're, when you're trying to manage uh, materials like that. So this one is sun scald on peppers. Tomatoes can get sun scald as well, as well, but generally out in the field, most folks are growing their tomatoes as steak tomatoes. You don't see nearly the kind of sun scald on them as you do on bell peppers. Bell peppers will sun scald, and this often happens right after a thunderstorm because the plants will lay over. 
I strongly recommend you stake your peppers. Um, you box stake them, and you can look up online how to do that. It's much easier than staking tomatoes. But at least when you stake your peppers, um, you get a storm, they're not gonna lay over, and you can eliminate this sun scald. There are some sprays out there that will help protect them, but really the best way to prevent against sun scald is don't let the plants lay over in the first place and go from being fully shaded to now being exposed to the sun. Um, so we're gonna talk about stake, stakes a little while later when we get into tomatoes. What I like to do is use new stakes for the ones I just bought this year in my tomato patch. And then those stakes go to peppers next year and they go in the wood stove after that. Um, that that's a nice way of having clean stakes. You're very unlikely to carry a tomato disease into your peppers. Um, and, but the longer they're out in the field, the more likely your stakes are gonna be a source of inoculum, especially for bacterial diseases. And like I said, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, indoor air, I alluded to this a moment ago, indoor air can really be a problem. So on the left, you're looking at, this is F nasty on tomato in a high tunnel. And this is simply um, based on the ethylene that comes out of the heat source. So I do not recommend purchasing used propane heaters. I am not a fan of them, um, unless you know the person you're buying it from and it's a very recent one. I've run greenhouses for a lot of my life and uh, propane heaters, it's the heat exchanger that gets to be a problem. It's a high humidity environment, um, very hard on equipment. And so when you get an older propane heater that you've got that great deal on, but the heat exchanger leaks, this is often the result of that, where you have ethylene leaking out and the ethylene causes this. The plants are never gonna perform well. And what you will often see, while this is not a big deal, is the, the, the fruit will abort and you'll never get good fruit to set. So Epinasty can be a huge problem. One of those places I really like um, with tomatoes, well, with, with, with tunnels or greenhouses is spend the money, get a new, get the highest efficiency heater that you possibly can. That's where you're going to save money versus a worn out used piece of equipment. The one on the right was kind of interesting. This is when you get to be a detective and all of you are automatically detectives now that you've signed on to this meeting. It'll be the quality of your detection that happens. Um, the grower called me up. It's a very good tomato grower. He had built a new facility. He put in a high efficiency coal furnace, uh, wanted me to come out and see it. And so I'm out and I'm looking around and I see this on all of his leaves. And um, he just, he was kind of writing it off, but I'm looking at this and I'm going, this is, this is really a problem for you. And this is from your coal furnace. So we started looking, we couldn't find any leaks. And it turned out that every time he opened up the, out, the outside door to bring coal in and the furnace was running, he changed the way that air moved around in his furnace and actually started drawing fumes backward out into, out into his greenhouse. And so this is coal fumes getting out on his plants. This happened a couple times a day when he would come in with coal to refill the hopper up. Solution, um, either move the coal furnace out and only bring heat in or um, have a bigger supply of coal indoors so that you're not having to open the door so much. Exact same thing with wood furnaces. Um, I do not like seeing wood stoves inside houses. I want them out separate building or one of those outside wood stoves so you're just putting hot water in. This is an easy problem to prevent. But you could see, you start looking at this thinking, I have some kind of fungal disease. So let's talk about vine crops for a little bit. And, and I, I was talking to our host, Dan, earlier. When we get to the end of vine crops, we're gonna take a little bit of a break and Dan is gonna coax me through whatever questions you all have put in the chat room and then we're gonna get on really important stuff like tomatoes. So here in the Northeast slash Mid-Atlantic, um, it's a high humid environment. And so we get powdery mildew, downy mildew, bacterial wilt. Uh, bacterial wilt is vectored by cucumber beetles. Um, and so we typically start off the season with striped cucumber beetles. As the season wears on, um, we start seeing more and more spotted cucumber beetles. They've got it in their gut. So their feeding is a really big problem um, because they carry it to our vine crops and it, it, the plants just collapse. It's worse on young plants than it is on older plants. Once plants get really well established, it's not nearly as big a problem. Watermelons don't experience it nearly like cucumbers and musk melons do, uh, but it's a big problem. Remember, this is about managing cucumber beetles. Uh, we've got fusarium stem leaf and fruit rot. 
It's not unusual that you're breaking new ground, um, ground that hasn't seen uh, a vine crop in 20 years or more, um, that you've got fusarium there already. And so that's one of the places that copper really shines out um, as a material in preventing that. So critical copper sprays can help. Uh, Phytophthora is a constant challenge for vine crops, um, especially in wet areas. So higher and um, higher areas, areas that are drained well make a big difference. Um, peppers suffer from this disease badly as well. Uh, you may have to do very long rotations out in order to drive Phytophthora levels down. And Phytophthora has got a nasty problem. It may start in a wet spot in your field and you'll see vines collapsing, but the spores can actually swim right along your drip line and move up out of there and infect plants outside of there. And you'll see stem and root rots. We looked at a few viruses. We've got five here in our area that are relatively common. Gummy stem blight that I'll show you a picture of in a little bit. And there's a lot of anthracnosis in the area. And all anthracnosis typically mean is that we have some kind of lesion. Uh, generally, this is a Colototricum fungus that causes it, most commonly Colototricum acutatum, but we've got a lot of anthracnosis. What all of this means is that you need to be very proactive in how you manage your vine crops. So let's look at some pictures of stuff so um, you guys have a better idea. This is severe powdery mildew. When you get to this point, you've just given up. If you did not get on top of managing this really early, um, you just simply lost this crop. You'll never, you're never going to get any profit out of this. This is an X crop at this point. So you're out in your field and you want to be looking all the time for what's going on. Typically what you'll see is a couple little pencil, pencil eraser size spots. That'll be the first thing. Can be on the bottom of the leaf, can be on the top. And um, that's your time to be doing something. If you haven't done anything already, now it's time to jump on this. And we'll talk about things that you can do as we get further in. Um, and so this is already, you can see the difference between this image and the last one. This is already pretty far gone. That leaf is going to die. Um, and so you need to be ahead of this. This is on a cucumber. Um, you need to be ahead of this at this point. And trying to keep, this is, uh, you're gonna hear some, um, little some editorializing at times because I've been out in the field for a long time looking at these. Um, trying to keep cucumbers fruiting for more than five or six weeks um, or zucchinis for more than three or four, I think that's a really big mistake. It's a real challenge to your pest management skills. If you want to have summer squash or zucchini all summer long, then be prepared to replant them constantly. And you want to start on the leeward side of your farm and plant toward the windward side of your farm. So what that means for most of us is we're gonna start planting our vine crops in the east and cucumbers, by the way, cucumbers and squash, these summer squashes and zucchinis, they are really the poster child for doing this because you can get a number of plantings in and mature during our growing season where most folks are going to not be able to accomplish that, certainly not for watermelons and a lot less for musk melons. They have a very short time the summer squash, zucchinis, and cucumbers, a very short time from seeding or transplanting to fruiting. So you can do a number of generations. So start in the east, that's the leeward side of your farm, start planting there and move windward with your planting so that you're not blowing these spores all over your new young plants. Plants that are fruiting are a lot more likely to get powdery mildew but the idea is not to dump all of these spores all over it. So plant away, um, plant into the wind versus the other way around and figure that you're gonna fruit your cucumbers for five or six weeks, your summer squash or zucchini for three or four, then you wanna mow them down and destroy them. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. One is reduce the source of inoculum, but the other one is for cucumber beetles, you're probably not, you're probably gonna stop spraying them and the last thing you want to do is have these sources of insects there that are just buzzing all over your new young crops. So getting rid of these, these older plants as you go, as soon as you're done picking a vine crop, you want to turn off the water, mow it down, rip it out, be done with it, just simply to eliminate this kind of inoculum. Um, this is downy mildew. And the best thing I can tell you, there's a lot of downy mildews out there. Um, and so there's a, if you go, go online and look up the downy mildew pipe, P-I-P-E, 
and you'll see they have predictive models and reports on where downy mildew is. So I have long been work, working out of Pennsylvania. My experience has been is that when we see so when we see the beginning of vine crop downy mildews, and they, they are very specific for which particular vine crop they're on. So there are a number of them, and it's worthwhile hanging out at the downy mildew website for a little bit and figuring out how they do it. But they have sentinel plots scattered all throughout the area. When they report the first downy mildew, you want to be aware of what's going on. And what I have long noticed is that when we start seeing downy mildew, this is for Pennsylvania, when we start seeing downy mildew in Southern Maryland or on the Eastern shore, or we're seeing it in Michigan, it's time to get your, it's time for you to start managing downy mildew. Um, it only takes a couple storms and we're looking at this. Powdery mildew, powdery mildew is in our area all the time. It's just waiting for the right conditions. It overwinters here really well. Downy mildew must come in with the weather in the Northeast Mid-Atlantic. And so you need to watch these models as they're showing up and these hot spots, and that will tell you when it's time to start managing downy mildew. Learn what it looks like. Um, it, it does not look at all like powdery mildew. And just because they're both called mildews, do not be at all confused. They are completely different organisms. Um, they have nothing in common whatsoever. Powdery mildew is almost easy to manage compared to downy mildew. You just need to be on top of them. And if we have years like 2018, where the leaf wetness just stays forever, managing downy mildew just becomes impossible. Not any different for organic farmers than it is for conventional farmers. It can be very, very difficult to manage this disease in times where we have a lot of leaf wetness. Um, Copper damaged musk melons. Again, this is uh, just, I, I like this picture a lot, so I put it back in again. I think it's actually pretty. Um, angular leaf spot. So this is a bacterial disease of vine crops. Um, it happens in cooler weather, um, as a lot of bacterial diseases do. Um, all the spots will start dropping out at some point. This is not a hard disease to manage. Uh, you just need to, to look for it really er early on. Um, this is one that you're probably going to be looking at copper and regalia and transparency. I sell regalia. I'll try and point those out at various times. Um, my company makes a number of biological and, or biological and organic products. One of the things that we have noticed is that the tank mix of coppers, and we've tank mixed them with a lot, with regalia does a really superior job managing a lot of uh, bacterial diseases. So this one is gummy stem blight. This is another disease, of course, of vine crops. Um, that's not unusual. We've seen some reports of this already on the Eastern shore from Jerry Brust, one of the researchers at the University of Maryland. Um, the only thing you can do is stay out front on this particular disease. You've got to run a proactive program, and we will get to that in a moment. So, we looked at a lot of ugly stuff already. Um, the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, it's a really tough place to grow vine crops. It's a tough place to grow vegetables. There's a reason that we do this. Uh, first off, if you're on this call um, and you're looking to do this at any level of commercial, you probably have some degree of insanity because this is a very tough area to do these things in. Uh, the humidity and all that really drive our pest complex. However, the same part of it is the business person in you because between Boston, Richmond, and Columbus, Ohio, we have about 57% of the U.S. population. They love locally grown products. That is our ace in the hole. So all the effort that we, grow, that we go to to produce healthy and good-looking fruits and vegetables pays off because we have such a huge market here. It's so different from California while California has a very high coastal population, they have to ship a lot of produce in our direction to make a profit, as do most of the rest of the U.S. We have so much population here that you don't have to ship stuff very, hot, very far. Here in central Pennsylvania, we are 12 driving hours from like 57% of the U.S. population, and they want locally grown produce. Um, here it's too cool early. That was our season this year, although it was too warm, then too cool. Um, I mentioned that this is about powdery mildew and downy mildew. We've talked about this. We have a lot of insects, aphids, squash bugs, squash vine borers, spider mite, striped and spotted cucumber beetles. They all just love a good vine crop. Um, we talked about this succession thing. Oh, and for cucumbers, uh, you, you really should give some thought 
to growing cucumbers in high tunnels. I have been a proponent of this since the early uh, 2012 or so. Um, it's wonderful because you can screen a high tunnel, and I'm talking regular window screening, which keeps cucumber beetles out. Once you keep cucumber beetles out, um, spraying for the rest of insects and mites makes it very, very simply to do that biologically and organically. That also gives you a real heads up on managing diseases at the same time. And I'll show you a picture of uh, some of my stuff in a little bit. So before we actually start about managing diseases, there are, this is IPM. So integrated pest management means that you are not just spraying, and that's a good thing because um, one of the challenges with organic growing is we don't have the high, the big tool set that conventional or synthetic growers have. Our tool set is a lot smaller. Um, and so all of the other practices that go into managing disease really make a big difference. Number one is sanitation. You should feel really comfortable going into, and I'm assuming most of you have a greenhouse for holding transplants or doing something in. Your greenhouse should be spotless. The table that you do your transplanting on, um, you should feel quite comfortable laying your um, hummus sandwich down. I, it's only because this is the pasta crowd. Um, laying your sandwich down on there, um, eating in your house. Um, I don't recommend it, but you're, that it should be so clean that you have no concerns about doing this. Um, the house just needs to be clean. In between batches of plants, you clean. All the stuff that we're doing now for COVID-19, um, a lot of those apply to what you do in your own operation. Clean operations have a lot less disease problems. It's very simple. These are, you're trying to eliminate places this can happen at. So when you're pruning, um, and we often prune, so um, when you're pruning your plants, you wanna be using very clean tools. You wanna to clean those tools often in between um, and use, use sanitation practices. So whether you're dipping them in a one to nine chlorine solution, you're using a peroxyacetic acid material like JetAg5, um, you're dipping them in alcohol, um, using Green Shield, which is not an organic remedy, but these quaternary ammonium salts are very good at sanitation. When you're pruning your plants, your pruner should be dead clean. Your pruner gets tacky, um, it's time to clean it. Uh, Formula 409 does a fabulous job taking all the goo off of your pruners, as do a number of other materials, but your pruner should always be clean and sharp. Roguing out problem plants. Um, not every plant is going to make it, not every plant belongs out in the field. And so when you're looking at your tray of, um, we'll pick on vine crops, you're looking at your tray of muskmelon slash cantaloupe, um, it might be a tray of 72, um, you may only have 68 plants that are worth putting out in the field. Don't put runts out there, don't put overgrown plants out there. When you see a plant that's getting sickly, try and figure out what's wrong with it, but they generally don't turn around. And if they do turn around, they're still not gonna make you money. Um, I was an extension agent for a long, long time. And um, I look at the spot that a transplant takes up in your field or any plant, it has a value to it. You're gonna put labor into managing weeds. You're gonna put labor into managing pests. You're watering it, you're fertilizing it. Putting a plant out there that's not gonna perform just makes no sense to me whatsoever. You're so much better off than just having an empty spot. Uh, so roguing out weak plants is a really big deal. Um, you wanna try and figure out what's wrong with it, but don't leave it in place. Um, I mentioned this cleaning your transplant production areas, cleaning your equipment is a big deal. Hose ends, so we typically are doing some watering with some kind of a wand sprayer or a, wand, a watering wand. That watering wand, the end of it, never touches the ground. There is no such thing as the five second rule. We've all been playing that game for a long time, but we're using science here. And when the end of your hose, when that, when that flaring end touches the ground, the very next plant that you turn on the water with it blows whatever it picked up off the ground onto those plants. You have just inoculated your plants with whatever is on the ground. If you drop your hose end, it touches the ground. The next thing you do is unscrew it and sanitize that before it goes back into place. When I go into greenhouses, what I love to see are um, hangers all over the place so that it's really easy when you stop to put that hose end um, into some kind of a holder so it's not gonna hit the ground. Um, a wire coat hanger does a great job, but all it takes is a hook. What you never wanna see is the hose end laying on the ground. That's, that's always asking for it. Um, so 
This one's gonna get into tomatoes. Um, so I mentioned this thing about new tomato steaks. My big concern are bacterial diseases in tomatoes. And this is bacterial speck spotting canker. At the very end of this presentation, I'll show you some pictures of these. Um, so bacteria are really tiny. Uh, fungi are large compared to bacteria. So bacteria are really tiny. If you ever look at like an oak tomato steak, you will see it's very porous. Um, it's not unusual for bacterial diseases to get into those pores. They can form a biofilm that protects them, that is impervious to all of our favorite sanitizing materials, impervious to a one to nine chlorine solution, impervious to a peroxyacetic acid jet ag solution. It's very, very difficult to sanitize them. And so when I'm growing tomatoes, I wanna put new steaks in there or properly sanitized. And as far as I'm concerned, there is only one way to sanitize a used tomato steak and that is with heat. Um, I actually have some growers that um, they have some friends who have kilns, like the kind you would use for drying wood. And over the winter, all of their tomato steaks get cycled through the kiln, brought up to 140 degrees at a minimum, um, and kept there overnight so that they can reuse those tomato steaks the next day. Now, I thought that was the only way to do this. And one of the things I love working with farmers is we are problem solvers. We're always looking at ways to solve a particular problem or another. And so the other way to solve that particular problem is to uh, um, put, put them in boiling water. So you can uh, set up a metal watering trough, build a fire underneath of it, get the water really hot, uh, make sure it's hot enough to you're getting over 140 degrees and simply boil your tomato steaks until the inside of that steak reaches that temperature. That's a good sanitized steak at this point. You'll hear at some point you're going, this is, sounds like an awful lot of work. It's a whole lot easier to take that steak, and this light's going to bother me. Um, it's a whole lot easier to take that steak. First year it goes into your tomatoes, next year it goes into your peppers, then it goes into your wood furnace after that. Um, so again, these bacterial diseases, a number of years ago, they prompted us to start working with hot water treatment. There's a great um, Ohio State University and OSU guide called Hot Water Treatment of Tomato Seeds. You can find it online easily. That's got very specific directions for how to hot water treat your tomato, pepper, and broccoli seeds. The only thing I can tell you, because we don't have time to go into that this evening, is read the guide carefully, follow the directions meticulously, do not try hot water treatment on your stovetop. The, the problem is, is you have to hold the temperature at, a, I think it's 122 degrees. I know I'm very close there for 20 or 25 minutes. If you're a couple degrees high, you'll certainly kill the bacterial diseases, but you'll probably kill the embryo of the seed that you're treating. If you're a couple degrees too low, um, you're not gonna kill the bacteria. And so all the work you're doing doesn't matter. Um, they make uh, these uh, scientific hot water baths that do a really good job. But I know people that have used immersion hot water cookers, the kind you would get from a cooking supply, a chef supply house, and they've done really well with using those. Um, and so they, these, immerse, these hot water immersion heaters can get you that kind of precision. Follow the directions carefully. Um, for tomatoes and peppers, you can actually do this, dry the seeds out, and then plant them when you need to. For broccoli, and we're not gonna get very deep into cold crops this evening, but broccoli suffers from black rot. Um, it can be carried on the seed. And so you can prevent that by hot water treating your broccoli seed. The problem is, is that with broccoli, you do that and the seed coats all blow off. And so you've got to plant that immediately where you can hold your tomatoes and peppers and plant them again over the next bunch of weeks. When the broccoli seeds come out of hot water treatment, they go right in the seed trays because what you're going to find is a lot of sludge in your hot water heater where all the seed coats blow off. Um, whatever equipment you use, this is a daily occurrence is cleaning off your equipment. You ought to have a good area, whether it's a rototiller, rotovator, tractor, whatever you're using, the cleaner your equipment, the less problems that you're going to have. Um, and I have a pressure washer is a great way to do this. Don't give yourself a new problem though and uh, pressure wash it and have that water run down into your field. You want to make sure that you know where that water is going, preferably down your driveway away from your property, certainly not into a stream that you're drawing water back out of. Think about where your water goes. 
um, it's a really big deal. Uh, but cleaning off your equipment makes a really big difference. Your water source, um, know your water source well. If you're drawing out of a stream, creek, or river, remember everybody that's up water of you matters into what you're pulling out of that water. It's not unusual to see Phytophthora infections. Remember, it's a swimming spore um, occurring because somebody is irrigating out of a creek, stream, or river. They picked it up from one of their neighbors who's upstream. Uh, you can get nutrient problems too, but I really worry about these water molds or waterborne spores uh, when you're pulling water. Nothing is as good as a nice deep well. Once you get over about 80 feet, in general, you're not going to be pulling diseases out. So know your water source really well. And um, this is not a nutrient talk, but I've worked in plant nutrition for a very long time. The pH and alkalinity of your water matter a lot. So tomatoes, and I'm going to not go very far down this path, tomatoes prefer to feed at a pH of 6.2 to 6.5. That's really important. If you get that pH right, it's very easy to grow or much easier to grow good tomatoes. If your pH is much above that, and we have a lot of limestone water throughout the mid-Atlantic, um, it's very difficult to grow good tomatoes, mainly because you're not getting enough potash to them. You'll see yellow shoulder, and you may have to inject acid. For organic growers, that means they're probably going to be injecting citric acid into their water, um, maybe vinegar, but most of us use citric acid. So know your water, get it tested at a lab. If you know your water's pH and alkalinity, you have a number of ways of modifying that. And as much as I am feared of doing this with so many people, um, if you want more on that, again, my email will be at the end and I'm sure you can get hold of me just by looking me up through Maroon Bio. I will gladly help and counsel you on your water. I've done it with many hundreds of people in the past. Uh, we talked about the heat sorts and maintenance, old heaters, old heaters aren't worth a darn. Actually, every time somebody comes to me and they've told me they got a deal on their greenhouse, um, usually by the time they finish putting up somebody's used house, they've done all the repairs to it, they've replaced all they had to, they found out that it would have been a heck of a lot cheaper just buying a new greenhouse. Um, shop, take a look around, but used greenhouses are very hard to make pay. And then the last one, um, I don't know many of you on this call, although I do recognize a few people's names. Um, and so how clean you are each day. Uh, the rubber boots that you wore yesterday should be pressure washed off or at least clean well before they go back out in the field. The clothes that you wore yesterday among your vegetables, they belong in the hamper. You should be wearing clean clothes every day. Your staff should be doing that. This is just really simple. Organic matter on your clothes carries things. And by starting off clean every day, um, it helps you out a lot. And while we're on this subject, if you have parts of a field that are questionable, you, they're, they're getting in trouble, you're not quite sure what's going on yet, you work all the clean parts of your field, the healthy parts of your fields first, and you go into the parts that are having challenges last. You also spray in that direction so that you're not moving those problems into your clean, fresh parts of the field. Um, I'm gonna use my favorite Albert Einstein quote here, um, because it would seem like my recommendations are commonsensical, uh, but as Einstein said, common sense is remarkably uncommon, and we work a lot of hours. When you're doing 14, 15 hour days, it is remarkable how difficult it is to remember to do basic things like cleaning the equipment when you've got, you're, you're hungry, you're tired, you just want to finish off your day. As you start dotting your I's and crossing your T's, you will get more successful. So this is our toolbox. This is now we're, now we're into pesticides for managing downy mildew and powdery mildew in vine crops. Um, I have kept this to organic and biological materials. All of these materials, with the exception of one um, class that we'll get to, all of these qualify as organic. Many of them are biological. Um, and I'll point out the ones that my company sells on the way through just for transparency purposes. So regalia is the first one on this list. Um, regalia is giant knotweed extract. Um, it's, the, it's what our company was built on. It turns on the plant's SAR and ISR systems. We'll get to this later on in more detail. Um, but by turning on the plant's own defense systems, it makes your job of managing pests that much easier. Really powerful for powdery mildew, not so powerful for downy mildew. 
And so where each of these materials fits in, um, this is a master's class that we're going to only get partially into tonight. I am a huge fan of using kelp supplements. Um, Stimplex is the, is the long-standing organic material. It is from a North Atlantic sustainably harvested brown seaweed. Um, it's an Ascophyllum nodosum, if I remember, but there are a lot of seaweed extracts out there. Um, Stimplex is nice and simple. It is just seaweed extract. Um, there are others that will put nutrients in them and other materials in. They all fit under this large um, umbrella group of biostimulants. I have seen them do miraculous things, but with all of these materials, none of these are going to clean up an existing problem. They are all best used proactively. And it's more so in the organic world than it is in the conventional world. It's not unusual with synthetic and conventional materials that you can move yourself back a couple days. Some of those materials are very good at buying you back a couple days into an infection. With these materials, you are anticipating problems, you're staying ahead of them, um, and you're doing it based on the time of year, your experience, um, the status of your crop, the weather that you see coming. You can see IPM is a very, very big bulk. Um, there's a lot of Bacillus subtilis products. They are some of the first biologicals that came along. Um, I have worked with Companion Cease and Serenade. They are all various strains. The strain of the Bacillus matters a lot. Each of these strains, um, so Bacillus subtilis, genus and species, then you have the various strains. Each of these, well, Companion is a strain, Cease and Serenade are another strain. Um, the strains are important because the way I want you to think about bacteria is they're little chemical powerhouses. They make stuff. And so each strain makes different stuff. As you can imagine, what they make has a lot to do with how you manage diseases. And we'll get into this some more. Um, Stargus is our newer material. We released it in 2018. Um, does a decent job on powdery mildew, but an amazing job on downy mildew. Um, an okay job on vine crops. It's the first new mode of action that's organic and biological for vine crops, but amazing on spinach and basil downy mildew. Not all downy mildews are the same. Um, does a really good job there with a decent job um, for downy mildew on vine crops. Um, trichoderma products like Root Shield Plus, these are best used as root inoculants. They're actually living materials that live in the root zone. Actinovate AG, um, which is uh, a Streptomyces product, another one that I like using in the root zone. Um, our company's competitor, Certus, puts out Double Nickel, which is a Bacillus amyloliquefaciens product. Um, nice job for boosting powdery mildew control and um, has, some, has some places for managing bacterial diseases. Lifeguard is Bacillus mycoides, a very powerful tool for downy mildews. Um, very interesting material. Um, low rates um, at like four ounces to the acre. Uh, I wish I was not a fan of it, but it does a pretty good job. There's a lot of multiple biological mixes out there now. These are all living materials where they're combinations of trichoderma, harzianum, and various bacillus, and they're designed to live in the root zone, um, in the rhizosphere, and they do a really nice job protecting plants from diseases. Um, we mentioned, I mentioned coppers a couple times. So coppers have a love-hate relationship with organic growers. Um, we are constantly trying to reduce the amount of copper because we're so reliant on it. And at the same time, those copper ions do a really nice job of helping to control disease. If you are managing powdery mildew in pumpkins and winter squash, sulfur is a major material. Also in lettuce, does a really nice job on powdery mildew. Um, a lot of plants are not tolerant of sulfur. Typically, the rate's four pounds to the acre. Sulfur is super cheap, um, but for powdery mildew on pumpkins and winter squash, like butternut, acorns, and, and uh, spaghetti squash, a really interesting material for managing just powdery mildew, not downy mildew. I, I see a lot of these citric acid products out here. I will admit not having a lot of um, experience with them, um, they are obviously designed to push the pH on the outer surface of the plant way down. And I could see where they would have an impact on pest populations because of that. There are a number of those. So I mentioned that not all of these qualified as organic, and that's these phosphonic acid products. Prophyte, Phosphorol, Topaz, 
There's a number of them out there. Um, they are very soft products. They certainly fit under all of, I would think, all of our definition of sustainable. They, for Phytophthora, if you get it out there early and keep it in place, and the same for downy mildew, these are a nice part of a program. So you're never, they, never do I want you to just go, hey, I'm a real big fan of this material and it's all I spray. We typically are doing tank mixes and rotational mixes and changing them during the season so that we're staying ahead of these. And I'll, I'll have an example for you in a moment. I'm a big fan of soaps and oils. Um, early in the season when it's cool, plants are a lot more tolerant of higher levels. As it gets hot, you've got to watch your concentration. You don't want to blur burn your plants. Phytotoxic burn leaves do not make you money. And then last on this list is potassium bicarbonate. Um, this raises the pH on the outer surface of the plant. Does a really nice job with powdery mildew, but it's really hard on the plant's waxy cuticle. I like to use it and pack it up for a month before I come back to it. So this is a very, um, uh, very simplistic way of, this is a proactive program for managing vine crop disease. We'll use this for cucumber production. So we start off spraying a tank mix of regalia, two quarts to the acre with a copper fungicide. Um, your favorite copper, there's a number of them out there. Um, and so that's your first spray. You rotate that with Stargus plus new film P. So now we're introducing a new concept and these are um, adjuvants or surfactants. They're really important um, because the last thing you wanna do is get done spraying and then it rains that night and you have to go back out and spray again because it all just washed off. So adjuvants do two things, two important things um, with vegetables. One is they act as spreaders. They get rid of that waxiness or they help get past that waxiness so you get a good spread on the leaf. So whatever you're spraying will get into the nooks and crannies but also cover the entire leaf. And then the sticker in there, once it dries, the sticker will help keep it on. I mean, if you get an inch of rain in 20 minutes, it's not gonna do much. But if you just get a rain overnight, you don't have to charge back out and do the next thing over again. Um, so in wet weather, you may have to apply really often. In dry weather, you might be able to spread out your sprays by 10 days. This is that common sense thing, it's really tough. Um, under severe pressure, you may have to go out and apply a PAA material often. Um, and that's simply to drive down the amount of inoculum. Uh, we often see botrytis in high tunnels and greenhouses. One of the best things you can do is come in with jet ag and use that to drive the inoculum down, always remembering that there's no residual from a PAA spray. And how you spray matters, how the kind of coverage that you get. Um, what I often see, this, this comment on here, is that how you spray, when you spray, the way you spray, the quality of your spray has a lot more to do with your success than the material. Many of these materials that I noted are very effective, but if you spray too fast, you don't use enough water, um, use so much water, it all runs off. Um, there's a lot of things you can do to mess up your spray, but using the right pH and the right adjuvant makes a really big deal. So I put, I'm trying to keep the data slides on this thing very limited uh, because we could get really in the weeds quickly. This is just one particular trial. This is controlling cucumber downy mildew. This is out of North Carolina. The number in the left column, that's the AUDPC. The higher the number, the worse the problem. Very, very simple. So the UTC is the untreated control, um, relatively high amount of downy mildew in this one. Um, so the product Stargus at two quarts did a nice job. You can see at four quarts, it did a little bit better. And we're comparing this, however, in this particular trial. Um, this is a chemical program of Ranman, Manzate, and Thanos, and the standard works even a little bit better. So doesn't always work in a straight line like this, but this is a straightforward curve. And you can see that with the Stargus at the four quarts, you're starting to get some decent control of downy mildew. So a um, couple things to put together a vine crop program. So you're dealing with Phytophthora, cucumber beetles. Phytophthora, you're out of that field for at least three years. Uh, for cucumber beetles, you just don't want to be in that same field next year. And the reason is the, they overwinter in the soil. The last thing you want to have are cucumber beetles come boiling out of the ground right back into another vine crop. That's a real, that's a real version of catastrophe. And you can prevent that. The further away you can put your vine crops from where they were last year, the better off you're going to be. I mentioned this one comment early on, and I went fast over it, is using healthy transplants. Um, a transplant has a very finite life expectancy. 
Um, for like most vine crops, you got about 15 to 21 days after you seed when that's actually a usable plant. It starts getting too tall. Um, it starts, you, you just, you'll, they'll fold over, they'll get torn up in the wind. Um, you don't want anything, you don't want to use an old one. And sometimes it means we're forced to dump trays. If we get a rainy week and you can't get out in the field, you're watching those plants get old. Sometimes the best thing to do is just start seeding new ones and dump those out. It's going to break your heart. I have worked with people who are new in this business and when they have to throw away a transplant, you can tell it's just everything went into that. Um, but new young transplants are always better than old transplants. I'm a huge believer in none of these are my products. Uh, Root Shield Plus, Actinovate AG, or TerraGrow. I'm a huge believer in using these biological living inoculants. They stay alive during the season. They grow on or actually infect your plant's root system, and they do a number of things to help protect your plants and also to help them grow better. They are your friend and they make your life much easier. And the little expense, you're talking typically about a half a cent per plant, very much worth, worth looking into. When I put transplants out, the first thing I do is um, spray them with regalia. It turns on their, the plant's own defense system. Um, and then every seven to 14 days, I'm following up with subsequent applications. Um, most of these biologicals that I was showing you on that slide, most of them are going to um, turn on the plant's SAR, ISR system to some extent, uh, but some of them do a really, job, really good job and regalia is one of them. I mentioned earlier about aphids for virus. Uh, monitor for aphids. Um, you've got a lot of options here for managing aphids. Um, you'll see some of them in this slide. <laughs> These are indoor grown cucumbers, one of my favorite ways to do it. These are parthenocarpic cucumbers. Um, they do not require pollination. Uh, there's a number of varieties out there. I believe these are Corintos in the picture, but there's Corinto, Lisboa, Lagos, quite a few. Um, what makes all of them work, because you're eliminating cucumber beetles, is um, you can see the uh, intake in the picture uh, that has screening over it. This is regular patio window screening. I buy 100-foot rolls from Lowe's, Home Depot, pick your favorite home store. I cover up all the entrances. Um, these are rolled up sides on a high tunnel. So once I roll them up, I drop the window screening down, make sure the door stays closed. That can be a real problem if you're leaving the door open. Once you keep cucumber beetles out, you don't have to spray with pyrethroids. When you don't have to spray with pyrethroids, you're not going to kill the beneficials that are keeping your aphids and white flies and western flower thrips in check. It's much easier to run a very soft insect program. You, you, they won't manage themselves, but the idea, here is, yeah, the idea here is not to have to use pyrethroids on the cucumber beetles so that you aren't looking at aphid flares over and over again. This is a great system. I'd love to talk to anybody who wants to. There's, we have a lot of these going on in Pennsylvania. Um, let's see, I'm gonna skip past this one. We've covered a lot of this already. So Dan, I'm assuming you are still on the line. I cannot see the chat room. So Dan, let me know, do we have, do we get a chat room back going again or should I just move so, into tomatoes? So Steve, if you would like to take, unfortunately we do not have the chat up. However, we can allow people to take, to. Um, Submit questions by answer, raising their hand. There's a raise hand feature if they click on participants, if that's what you'd like to do, or we can move on to tomatoes and take questions after. It's up to you. Um, let's, let's, I can't see that. I'm not looking at that screen. So Dan, I'm gonna let you, if you see, um, let's do a couple minutes. If somebody's got their hand up, I'll try and answer their question. But I am not looking at that screen right now. I, sure. I'll look at the screen and Dan, Yep. All right. Okay, so we've got, uh, looks like Andrea, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned about the tomato steaks. We use um, raised beds um, and we, we have, um, this is outside, not in the greenhouse, and we grow our tomatoes up a string, but we do have pieces of lumber, you know, uh, trellising that. How important is it or how much should I be worried about that lumber that's not coming into direct contact with the tomatoes and also just the raised beds themselves in terms of carrying um, diseases? 
So here, here's the big concern. You ask excellent questions, Andrew. So the big, big problem here is, did you have a bacterial disease? That's where my concern goes. If you didn't, if you haven't dealt with bacterial speck spot or canker, first off, be happy that you're not dealing with them. It's not nearly the issue. I don't worry about fungal diseases, um, late blight, early blight, septoria. They're not really the issue with wood. It's, it's, it's the bacterial diseases. Um, and so if you're dealing with bacterial diseases, it's a really big deal. But if they have not been an issue for you, that is not a big deal. And permanent raised beds, yeah, they can, they can be a problem. But, you know, if you, if you can do any kind of rotation in soil building and you're using the root shield, Actinovate or um, TerraGrow, they do a really nice job of helping to protect your soil for the long run. Uh, they are very jealous guardians of your soil. And so be consistent with doing that and keep an eye out for the bacterial diseases. If they become an issue, if they don't have to touch your plant, the stake only needs to be in the soil. The bacteria will disperse in the soil very nicely um, and they'll find their, find their way to your plants. It's not unusual to be out scouting in a field and um, have hot spots that are around certain stakes and you just know that they weren't sanitized properly. And most folks try and dip them into either bleach or peroxyacetic acid solution, and that just will not kill bacterial diseases. It's just, it, the, the chemistry is not up to that problem, but they do a nice job. So you should be pressure washing your stakes in between uses at least. Um, treat them nice. Um, if you're using metal, I know folks use rebar, tea stakes, or fiberglass stakes, they clean up really well. It's the porous wood stakes that are the real problem. Uh, other people with their hand up before we rock on. I see no other hands raised at this point. Good. Let's do tomatoes then. Let's do um, it. So before I got into ugly pictures of tomatoes, I wanted to put some pretty ones up. Um, so revel in these before we get funky for a bit. Um, this is late blight. Um, late blight is the real, it's when we get away from bacterial diseases, it is the most serious of all tomato diseases. Here in Pennsylvania, it often occurs toward the end of the season when we get it. We don't see it every year. Um, some years we get to skip past it entirely. Um, it typically will come in, um, off, it's off, often comes in off of potatoes, potato cull piles. Um, but a couple years ago, we had, had it come in on transplants. It came in on petunia transplants of all things. Petunias and tomatoes are very close relatives. And so petunia cuttings came in, they had it. Um, greenhouses, remember how they operate. Um, they draw air in and blow it back out. And so the greenhouses were actually acting as reverse vacuum cleaners and blowing late blight spores all over the place. These typically come in as a summer disease and they come in with thunderstorms. They can move 50, 60 miles in a day. Um, you'll see they call these grease spots. It looks like axle grease. So I'm gonna give you all a really good diagnostics uh, tool that when you see this kind of thing, when you see this fur on the bottom of the leaf, when you see these grease spots, take a couple of the leaves, take an affected tomato, put them into a Ziploc bag with a paper towel, put it in the bottom of your refrigerator for 24 to 48 hours. If you see some white sporulating, some white foam around the outside, and you see that um, there's an arrow on the screen that shows some of that in that one picture, you'll see that in just a couple days. If you see that, you've got late blight. Um, and that's a real problem at that point. But if you don't, um, in, it's, it, you might have early blight or something else. We see early blight, it's also alternary. We see it every year. It is just a constant part of dealing with tomatoes. Um, but take a look at this image. And then these are early blight lesions. Um, very, very different. Um, you can see how they have the concentric rings, just a very different looking kind of a disease. Um, and so there's a, I know Penn State has a, uh, a publication called uh, Diseases of Vegetables or Vegetable Diseases. It's not a very expensive one. It'll help you, help you look, help you figure out what it is. Um, the, the lesions just look different. I'm going to flash back and forth. Take a look. You can see the concentric rings here in these images where the spore landed and then spread. Um, you often see yellowing around it. Where on the late blight, you typically, you don't typically see that kind of concentric ringing. Um, you'll see the fuzz on there and you'll see that mature white stuff by putting it in the refrigerator. The trick is Ziploc bag, the paper towel acts as a moderator for moisture. Um, and then uh, look at it in two days. If you've got that white foamy stuff, you've got late blight. It could be Buckeye blight, 
but for most of us, that's going to be late blight. That's a serious problem at that point. Um, so these are our disease controls. You've already seen them. They were there on the vine crops. There's a few less um, that could, I certain on my, I would never certainly use sulfur on my tomatoes. Um, and we'll get into these a little bit more. So I mentioned regalia. Um, does a lot of things, but what the way regalia does not work directly on fungal organisms, it works by turning on the plant's own defense systems. They're already there. Um, this is the ISR and SAR systems. They are worthwhile reading about. And if you send me an email, I'll send you an article that is guaranteed to put you to sleep. If you are an insomniac, this article will fix it for you immediately um, as you learn about SARs and ISRs. We rely on them very much so for managing our diseases. All we're doing is simply telling the plant that we're likely to have disease, do all this other stuff to prevent. A lot of the biostimulants that will accomplish this will also cut yields. Regalia actually boosts yield because it increases, increases chlorophyll B inside the plant. And I would love to get into the story but I, I have that I have noted at the bottom, but frankly, at this point, we're out of time. Um, Regalia plus copper, almost magic. There is a synergy there. I could have put up dozens of slides. And so this is bacterial spot on tomatoes. Regalia and copper are amazing for, for managing this. So in our untreated control, we have about 35% disease. Um, you'll see actinovate there with coside. So that's one of those other materials that I mentioned, one of the other bios with copper. Um, serenade, which is a bacillus subtilis with copper, but there's regalia with copper, um, saw our best control. We see this over and over again. Um, I ran tomato variety trials for Penn State since the year 2000. Um, this was my basic formula once regalia was available, is the combination of regalia plus copper. And I mentioned early on that I'm gonna mention a few synthetic materials. Um, for those of you who um, are not limited by organic, um, the combination of Mancozem regalia plus copper takes that to an entirely new level. Just remember with Mancozem in the mix, you have a five day PHI. So you've got to wait five days after you spray to do a harvest. Um, so for most tomato growers, that means that you stop using that when you start harvesting. Cease, another one of these Bacillus subtilis products. Um, Serenade is the same thing. Cease is the indoor version. Serenade is the outdoors. They're marketed by two different companies. I like this as a booster along with the rest of my program. I would never base a program on it, but to do like Regalia plus Cease, it's a good combination. Um, it's a nice booster material. Remember, it will wash right off, so we go back to that spreader sticker. Um, most of us, that means new film P. Um, new film P is a pinene based material. The pine sap is what causes the sticking. Um, the P formulation is the organic one. There's also new film and new film 17. For most of the folks on this call, you're going to be looking at new film P. Um, you're going to be, um, first time you use new film, you will probably want to call me up and give me hell. Um, it's really sticky, uh, but it goes in the solution really, really well. And so just get past the stickum. It's like an old container of maple syrup, but it mixes well and it does a great job. <laughs> so this is Stargus. I mentioned this is a new material for us in 2018. Um, it's got a really broad bunch of modes of action, uh, but um, this is a beneficial rhizobacterium, um, used as a foliar spray, but it also works nicely in the soil. Downy mildew, late blight, alternaria, which I spelled wrong there, alternaria, that's alternaria, which is also early blight, um, white mold, which is also known as sclerotinia and timber rot, um, cercospora and beets, you see that picture of beets, does a really nice job, some work at Cornell indicated how well, also helps manage botrytis. Um, contact me, I will gladly give you um, some different propaganda to help you support this. It is the first new mode of biological mode of action for managing downy mildew in a very long time. Um, Lifeguard, this is from Certus. This is a Bacillus mycoides. This is another living material. Like Stargus, you do not mix this with copper. Um, not a good idea. You'll kill it in the tank. Really low rate, really good for bacterial diseases. And I mentioned this for downy mildew. Um, also early blight, botrytis, and late blight. Double nickel, um, this is Certus's Bacillus amyloliquefaction. It is a specific strain. Um, I see this as primarily for bacterial diseases and another booster for powdery mildew control. Relatively broad label. Where it works, though, is I think uh, a lot of the question how to use it. 
Um, so this is double nickel, and this is a courtesy of my counterpart from CERTUS. Um, this is, uh, he sent me some of these slides. So this is bacterial spot, and I'm assuming that this is on peppers. Um, and you can see the untreated control on the left. This did not translate into this format really well, uh, but you can see the untreated control had relatively high, oh, this is tomato, a bacterial spot, um, double nickel way out in the right, um, along with Actigard, uh, which is not a biological material, did a pretty decent job helping to manage it. Um, this is a matter of staying on top of this. So these are these peroxyacetic acids or parasitic acid materials. There's a lot of them out here. Um, we sell JetAg5, so it's my reference material. They are amazing materials for killing inoculum, uh, but because there's no residual, you spray them and now you have to do something else. Where it really comes in handy is in greenhouses and high tunnels. You come in in the morning, it's disgustingly humid, the ceiling is dripping. That's ideal conditions for gray mold, also known as botrytis. Um, best thing to do is spray one of these peroxyacetic acid materials along with bringing the humidity down. That'll burn off all of the existing material that's on the outside. It'll kill all the spores and it gives you a fighting chance. Now you can put something else out there that's gonna slow the disease down. Um, I mentioned root shield in, in passing. Um, root shield, which is Trichoderma harzianum T22 and Trichoderma virens. These are two fungal organisms that are among the best materials at protecting in the root zone. It's got a really broad label. Um, you should definitely go to the BioWorks website. Also does some turning on of the SAR um, and ISR systems. You see that they're in bold there. Um, it does require refrigeration. And unlike a lot of the materials, because this is a living material, it has a one month shelf life, I mean a one year shelf life when kept under refrigeration. Um, and so if you're working with it in a hot day, put it in a cooler with an ice pack, take it out to where you're mixing it, keep it cool. Um, it's not gonna die real quickly, but do not put a bag of this on the, uh, um, in the windshield of your pickup truck and expect it to have anything left for the day. You can make it last a little bit longer frozen. Uh, I recommend folks buy it fresh in the springtime, use it up during the season, get new stuff the next year. I have seen it rescue so many crops. And again, I wish I had time for stories, but we are eight minutes from the end of this call. Um, actinovate, this is another one of these living materials. This one actually does something foliar as well. I use it both ways, uh, but in the soil, it, it's a living material. Uh, Fusarium, Rhizoctonia, Pythium, Phytophthora, Verticillium. Yeah, if I was you, I would pick one of these materials, use that as my primary thing, and inoculate every single transplant, whether it's a petunia, a sunflower, a tomato, a muskmelon, every plant should get a drench of this before it goes out to the field. And then think about putting that back out through the drip lines in six or eight weeks to bring that inoculum level back up again. Um, does some amazing things. So I mentioned these uh, potassium bicarbonate materials. So this is Milstop, Caligreen, Armicure, Armicarb 100, Green Cure. There's a lot of them. The, they're very high pH, which you would expect from a bicarbonate. Um, they are not biological. This is a very chemical material, but they are largely OMRI listed. Um, and so what they do is they pull water from the germinating spores. You only get to use it about once a month on a crop because it is very hard on the waxy cuticle. Um, I had a raspberry grower who, in, I told him only use it once. He used it two weeks in a row because it killed his powdery mildew so good, took every leaf off his raspberries. Those were some terrible tasting raspberries that year. Um, this stuff is hard on the waxy cuticle. So use it once, lock it up for a month before you pull it back out again. There's a lot of coppers out there. Um, and so with coppers, it's the copper ions slowly dissolving that do the actual work. The reason they still work is they're a multiple mode of action. They've been used around for a really, really long time. Um, pick one that you like. Um, a lot of them on here, so I know badge X2 qualifies or, as organic. There's a champ that's organic, um, co-side organic. I'm not sure about the others. Not all of them qualify as organic. Be careful what you mix it with. I mentioned Regalia mixes well with copper, but Stargus and Lifeguard don't um, because they're both living materials. And the way this works is the copper dissolves slowly and the ions do their thing. Do not use copper sulfate. A, 
it's not labeled. It does no label for use on plants. But as soon as it rains, it all just dissolves immediately, releases all those copper ions, and it's not there anymore. These other, all these other formulations do a really nice job at being released. And don't believe it when somebody tells you it's a systemic copper. I have never heard of such a thing. So how these, how these work is one is competition um, with, these bi with these living bios. You put them in the root zone and they simply outcompete all the other diseases. You've got so much of that there and they're very beneficial to the plant. And so as long as they're out there ahead of time, they're gonna do a great job. They also work by antagonizing. Um, they go out and they irritate. They can be parasitic to a other disease causing organisms. So they're great for that. Um, antibiosis. They release chemicals that do a lot of these same things um, and they will attack other organisms. And then one that even if you have no disease, this is one of the things you can really experience with like Root Shield Plus is it will help take nutrients up, especially phosphorus. So it really has a great role in improving the way that uh, plants take up phosphorus. And again, we're just running out of time. Um, systemic acquired and induced host resistant, SAR and ISR are the abbreviations. You'll often see them as the jasmonic acid and salicylic acid pathways inside the plant. This is turning on the plant's defense system, and I believe it is the most fundamental part after sanitation on how you manage plant disease. If you have them turned on and they're doing their job, they're going to make your job managing disease an awful lot easier. Um, so rotations are really good. But when you're in a tunnel or a greenhouse, almost all of you are just going to grow tomatoes, 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 because that's what pays. We've got to pay the bills. That can be a problem over time, but using those living biologicals will help to make your day of reckoning come out as far as possible. You want to push it out. Every chance you get, grow a cover crop. Every chance you get, build up your organic matter. The more organic matter is built up into that three to 6% zone, um, the more beneficials you're going to have there that are going to help. There's a lot of courses out there that will help you figure out the right cover crop. Cover crops are frankly a real pain to manage, uh, but they, what they do is worth all the extra effort. I am a huge fan of buckwheat. 45 days from seed to mowing it down. Um, and so it's one of those great ones you can insert into your summer season as you're getting a patch ready. And because nothing is related to buckwheat, does a really nice job of adding some organic matter, but confusing the stuffing out of any diseases that are out there. Um, I've mentioned some of these season long programs. We've walked through some of this stuff already. I wanna to get to the rest of my pictures before we're going. The way you spray matters. So one of the, the I'm, I'm gonna stand on a soapbox or a metaphorical soapbox for a moment. Um, most, don't, most people get into organic um, because they don't like spraying. I don't know any farmer that wakes up in the morning and goes, you know, I'm really looking forward to another day spraying all day long. And so a lot of people make the mistake of buying crappy spray equipment. They manage it really poorly. They take care of it poorly and therefore they get lousy results. I think that is completely backwards thinking. Get the best spray equipment for the job. So it's a pleasure to do and you get it on the way that you want to, um, which is great coverage and move on from there. There's a mini fogger on the right, which is great for indoor use. Um, this is a custom made sprayer on the left that we built when I worked for Penn State. On the back of, on the tailgate of this gator though, are two different backpack sprayers. One is the Solo 416, which puts out 42 PSI. The one to the right is the DRAM, D-R-A-M-M, BP4, 110 and 150 PSI, depending on how the switch that fine droplet size makes all the difference. You can put out less water, get more done. Good spray equipment matters a lot. Take care of your sprayers, learn how to use them. They will pay you over and over again. So bacterial diseases, they are our big one on tomatoes. Um, really easy to identify bacterial canker when it gets on your fruit because it forms these little halos and they are very indicative. There's nothing else that looks like that. Um, you can match them up to pictures you'll find online. When all you see is the firing, the burnt up foliage, it's a little bit tougher to ID it based on that. Um, this is bacterial speck and spot, um, and they are, the specks, you can actually feel them on there. Um, and obviously they are going to, they don't take your plants out, they don't kill your plants the way the canker does, but they sure do make it unmarketable. Um, white mold, also known as timber rot and sclerotinia, um, you'll see, you'll have a plant that's just starting to fruit and it collapses. 
um, open up the stem and this is basic IPM. You'll see, um, sometimes you'll see the white mycelia, but you'll see these little uh, rabbit pellets inside that are black. Never drop one of these sclerotial masses on the ground. Um, as soon as you do, now you've got a permanent problem. So when you have plants that die like this, this is that roguing skill. You bring a trash can or a plastic bag in, you get it out, you never compost these plants. These plants go into the burn pile or they go out with the trash. So a couple comments, uh, biologicals, unlike copper, unlike sulfur, um, they last one to three years. Read the instructions, learn about their shelf life. I like to buy them in the springtime, use them up over the season, get new inventory next year. Remember, you've got to be really proactive. You want to be out in front of all this. Um, if you wait to IT diseases to start control, very difficult organically to get it. Um, they are great for helping to manage resistance as you alternate materials and come up with different tank mixes. Remember, the strain matters a lot with these bios. You can be looking at two different strains of Bacillus amyloliquefaciens, and one strain will do what you need it to do, and the other, because it puts out different chemicals, may not come close. Read the directions and make sure that you're using the proper adjuvants. If you're not using a spreader or outdoor or spreader sticker, you're giving yourself a lot of extra work. And there, we got through all that. I had to skip a couple things getting there, but there's my phone number, there's my email address. Email is by far the best way to get hold of me. Um, I've got additional recommendations for a lot of these crops if you would like. If you're interested in any of the Marone products, I will gladly share information with you. And although we're a minute over, Dan, do we have anybody else that's asking any questions? Um, I'll stay on for a couple minutes if anybody wants to put their hand up. Sure, so if anybody does have any questions we've got, you feel free to raise your hand in the participant window and we'll call on you. Um, this is recorded and once we get it downloaded and processed, uh, it will be posted on the PASA uh, resources page for folks to reference back to. So if you missed anything, we'll, we'll get this up there, hopefully by the uh, middle or end of the week. Um, so it looks like uh, Kao has a question here. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Steve, thank you for your presentation. I have two questions. One is that, did you say to find out if tomato has a late bright, uh, put them in a plastic bag with a towel and keep it in, in the fridge or? Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great trick. It's an, it's an extension trick that I learned many, many years ago. So you take some leaves and fruit, the uh, affected ones, you put them in a Ziploc bag uh, with a paper towel put them in the bottom of your refrigerator and come back two days later and take a look. If you've got late blight, um, you typically right around the lesions, whether on the fruit or the leaves, you will see that white foaming. That's a really good indication. It's a lot faster than sending it to a pathology lab where you may, make, may wait 10 days or two weeks to get a report back. I see, thanks for the clarity. And another thing, do you know any biological control for Colorado potato beetles. You take a brick and another brick, keep your thumbs out from between the bricks, make sure the beetles are between those bricks, push them together, twist them until you have juice. You have now gotten a really great biological control for gum potato beetles. Using humans. <laughs> yeah, you're just crushing them or put them in the soapy water. Um, it is, it is uh, coming up with a beetle control material, Coleoptera, That'll manage cucumber beetles, flea beetles, potato beetles, um, and a number of other ones, harlequin bugs and all the other, that will manage that class of insects without damaging hymenoptera bees is like the holy grail. Every company would love to have that. Um, and a lot of companies have, got, have tried to get there, but it is a really big challenge. So when we're managing um, organically, when we're trying to manage cucumber beetles and potato beetles, we often are left with pyrethrum and spinosis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I see somebody else has raised their hand. Yep. Dan, Lyle. I'm gonna let you run this. Yep, Lyle, go ahead. And for anybody who's um, leaving, please, please do complete the uh, survey before you exit. We appreciate that, but go ahead, Lyle. Yeah, yes, hello, this is Lyle. Um, can I ask something? Assuming that this um, biological control are for temperate regions. Can this um, biological controls or IPM measures can be used on tropical regions? Yes, uh, so we, um, 
Yes, I, I only worry about the 12 Northeast states. I go Virginia North and Ohio East, but um, we sell in uh, Morocco, Africa, South America. Um, and so not every product is a fit everywhere. Um, we're now having conversations with our Brazilian partners. So there are biological fits um, in for many of those pests. Some of them I don't recognize. And so you really need to find people on the ground. Um, and so we're always looking for credible international partners, but we do a lot of tropical research. I know that we have, um, and I'm pretty sure it's regalia that gets used for managing um, is a black something on bananas. I'm not a banana expert, um, but I know that there are some banana diseases that we do a really nice job managing. Um, so yes, biologicals do fit. Um, it's, it, the trick here is always finding the right material for the right disease, how often to do it, your tank mix partners. This is going back to the IPM part of all of this. Okay, thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, I see we'd have time for maybe one more question. Um, if anybody wants to raise the hand in the chat box or in the, uh, in the participant box there. Um, and as I said, please do complete the uh, survey on the screen whenever you, uh, whenever you can. Well, I hope you all found this very useful. Um, I, it was an hour, an hour and a half went incredibly quickly. Thank you, all of you for attending this this evening. I hope you find these, this series really worthwhile. Hey, Dan, thank you for, thank you and PASA for inviting me to this. Yep, yeah, thanks Steve for, for doing it. And uh, just a reminder everyone, we'll be back here in two weeks and uh, again, two weeks after that. So we hope to see you uh, for our future IPM topics and uh, we hope you have a, have a good evening.